SOT Mobitel Fiber, the fiber of the nation. SOT Mobitel Fiber, the fiber of the nation. Comfort Moody and Bagi I Kalak Pavatina Alupinuai. Tonight, open roads. The government and the World Bank Inc. a 500 million US dollar financing agreement for rural connectivity development. Above authority, the Bar Association accuses the One Country, One Law Task Force of usurping constitutional mandated institutions. Act responsibly. Health experts warn long weekend travellers to stay home or risk another surge. Excessive number of people in a large number of groups, they are enjoying risking their lives. If you see a large gathering, it is very important to avoid that place. New methods. The central bank governor announces a new department to compete with informal foreign remittances. We will have a focused competition, not just do things that will help the process only. If you do it methodically, we can rake in at least $1 million more. All this and much more coming up on this Wednesday, the 3rd of November, 2021. From Adha Derana, this is Adha Derana First at Nine. Live from Studio 24 in Colombo. Good evening and welcome to First at Nine. I'm Shanela Fernando in your top stories for tonight. The Sri Lankan government and the World Bank inked an agreement this morning for a 500 million US dollars financing facility targeting the country's rural roadway development that the bank says will benefit 16 million Sri Lankans through enhanced agricultural supply chains. The agreement was signed by Treasury Secretary Sajid Artigala on behalf of the government and World Bank Vice President for South Asia, Hartwig Schaefer. The Sri Lankan government and the World Bank signed a financing agreement worth 500 million US dollars this morning. The funds are set to be used through the World Bank's Inclusive Connectivity and Development Program to develop a safe, efficient and climate resilient roadway system that is expected to strengthen Sri Lanka's agricultural supply chains. This project is part of the 100,000 km Rural Roads Development Program, a key initiative of the government's national development strategy. According to a World Bank release on the agreement, the project is expected to benefit an estimated 16 million Sri Lankans residing in rural communities in selected districts. The agreement was signed by Treasury Secretary Sajid Artigala on behalf of the government and World Bank Vice President for South Asia, Hartwig Schaefer. With Sri Lanka having the highest rate of road deaths in South Asia, Schaefer says that building an uninterrupted and safe road network is crucial to connecting rural communities to health and education services and economic opportunities as well. Further, he says that scaling up investments in roadways will contribute to the acceleration of human capital in Sri Lanka and lead to sustainable and inclusive economic growth. The project is expected to build on ongoing provincial and rural roads rehabilitation initiatives under the World Bank Finance Transport, Connectivity and Asset Management Project and the Asian Development Bank-funded Integrated Road Investment Programs iRoad 1 and 2. Big 3 Bar Association of Sri Lanka is the latest to criticize the president's recent appointment of the One Country, One Law Task Force, calling it a useless initiative and adding that it would usurp the functions of many institutions established under the constitution and the law. Writing to the president on the recent appointment, the BASL says that despite a number of mechanisms put in place to adequately serve the purpose of the task force, it remains improper and outside the accepted framework of law making. On the 27th of last month, a 13-member task force was established by President Gothabe Rajapaksa, tasked with the preparation of a draft bill to implement the One Country, One Law concept. The appointment drew heavy criticism from the opposition, particularly at the appointment of the chairperson of the task force, Venerable Galagodafti Nyanasara Thera, with parliamentarians calling the Thera unfit to lead. Concerns were also raised over the task force lacking Tamil-speaking members. 
Meanwhile, in the latest development on the matter, the Bar Association of Sri Lanka has written a letter to the President yesterday outlining their own criticisms. The association says that it fails to understand the need for the appointment of a task force that in effect is expected to oversee the drafting of key legislation by the country's constitutionally mandated legal bodies, namely the Justice Ministry and the Attorney General's Department. The association views the appointment of a task force for this purpose as improper and outside the accepted framework of lawmaking. The BASL also says that such a relocation of the functions of duly elected legislators to a separate entity such as this presidential task force in effect erodes the sovereignty of the people. In addition, the BASL also questions the expertise, qualifications and suitability of the chairperson of the task force, Bindrabal Galagodatte Nyanasara Thera, and many of its members to engage in their gazetted duties and expresses its doubts on the task force's ability to make any meaningful contributions in upholding values such as equality. Further, the BASL says that it does not recognize the task force as a representative body, pointing out that it neither contains female representation nor does it include representatives from the many ethnic and religious minorities in the country. In conclusion, the association says that it is of the view that the appointment of the task force is useless and alleges that the appointment aims to usurp the functions of the country's constitutional institutions, including Parliament and the Ministry of Justice. The fundamental rights petition filed by a member of the National Catholic Committee to serve justice for the Easter attack victims, Reverend Father Cyril Garmani Fernando, seeking an injunction order preventing his arrest, will be taken up by the Supreme Court on Monday. Reverend Father Fernando was summoned to the CID today to record a statement regarding recent comments made by him during an online forum for which a complaint has been filed by the Director of State Intelligence, Major General Suresh Saleh. However, Father Fernando did not appear before the department today and inform the CID that the Supreme Court will determine his future actions over its summons. In relation to a complaint filed by the Director of the State Intelligence Service, Major General Suresh Saleh, member of the National Catholic Committee for Justice to Easter Sunday attack victims, Reverend Father Cyril Gamni Fernando, was summoned before the Criminal Investigation Department today. The complaint was filed over comments made by Reverend Father Cyril Gamini, alleging that the country's intelligence arms had a hand in providing financial and other assistance to Zaran Hashim and his group. Despite being summoned, Father Fernando did not appear before the department today, although his legal counsel conveyed reasons for his absence to the officer in charge via letter. The attorneys pointed out that Father Fernando has filed a fundamental rights petition before the Supreme Court over an imminent infringement of his fundamental rights guaranteed to him under the Constitution. The attorneys also informed the CID that any future action regarding the summoning of their client to the CID will be taken as per Supreme Court orders. Meanwhile, the fundamental rights petition filed by Reverend Father Cyril Gamani Fernando was taken up in the Supreme Court yesterday, seeking a restraining order against his arrest and is set to be taken up for hearing on Monday the 8th of this month. The petitioner states that the CID was preparing to arrest him after recording his statement at 9.30 a.m. today, adding that an arrest without a valid cause violates his basic human rights. The Joint Trade Union Alliance of the Ceylon Electricity Board staged a protest in Colombo today calling for the withdrawal of the Yugadanavi power plant agreement with US-based company New Fortress Energy. Meanwhile, the Supreme Court will hear a fundamental rights petition filed by the Samagi Balavegia on the 12th of this month, which seeks to annul the decision to transfer shares of the Yugadanavi power plant and hand over control of LNG supplies to the US company. The Joint Trade Union Alliance of the Ceylon Electricity Board launched a protest today against the selling of a 40% stake in the Yugadanavi power plant in Keravalapitiya to US-based company New Fortress Energy, giving them the exclusive LNG supply rights. Organized in front of the CEB headquarters, the protest went on for about two hours. <laughs> ಅಮೆರಿಕಾನು 
Meanwhile, in a display of solidarity, the Ports Trade Union staged a protest outside the Sri Lanka Ports Authority today, objecting to the selling of port assets to foreign countries. <laughs> In the meantime, representatives of the Petroleum Trade Unions too joined the protest campaign today. Before the protesters stepped to the streets, the Vallampitiya police sought an injunction from the Colombo Additional Magistrate yesterday, citing public disturbance. However, the request was rejected by the court. <laughs> What's more, a date has been fixed to hear the fundamental rights petition filed by the Samagi Balavegia challenging the US Sri Lanka pact signed with regard to the Yugadanavi power plant in Keravala Pitiya. Accordingly, a three-member bench of the Supreme Court, consisting of Justices Murdu Fernando, Kumudini Vikramasinghe and Mahinda Sameh Vardhana, have decided to take up the petition for consideration on Friday the 12th of this month. The petitioner alleges that the Cabinet's decision to transfer shares of the Yugadanavi power plant to the US-based company was unlawful, adding that proper tender procedure has not been followed in the process. A number of figures, including Premier Mahinda Rajapaksa and the entire Cabinet of Ministers, West Coast Power Limited, who owns the Yugadanavi power plant, US-based New Fortress Energy, as well as the Attorney General, have been named as respondents. More news on the other side of this break. Stay tuned. Million at the Hat Hitasham Ati Universal, Lakshya Pahakiva, then Mavin Kravaganda, Malbury Residence. Welcome back in more news. Deputy Director General of Education and Research at the Ministry of Health, Dr. Hemant Tahirath, is calling on the public to avoid unnecessarily risking their lives by going on trips during this long weekend that he says can possibly lead to another outbreak. He also urged the public to avoid places where people gather in large numbers if they do end up travelling. With a public holiday falling tomorrow, the country is going in for a long weekend. With no more interprovincial travel restrictions, the gates have been left wide open for leisure travel. However, a fact that has been conveniently ignored currently is that the country is still reporting over 500 COVID-19 cases every day. After the Singhala and Tamil New Year, the entire country saw firsthand the effects of unregulated travels on COVID-19 cases. Although the situation today is much better than it was, cases could still rise unexpectedly if discipline is not maintained by the public. In this view, health experts are warning the public to be smart about where they travel to. We know that there are a large number of people who are already planned to go out, especially during the coming so-called long weekend. And also we have observed that large number of people have gathered in different places like religious places, tourist attractions and several other places. Excessive number of people in a large number of groups which consisting of much more than the family units and they are enjoying definitely but risking their lives and increasing the risk of spreading the COVID-19 disease among them. So therefore, in this moment, what I would like to advise all of those who have already planned, if there is any possibility to postpone it, it is better because large number of people have already planned to go and there will be large gatherings in places where you are planning to go. And in case you are going for a trip to a destination of that nature, if you see a large gathering of people, then it is very important to avoid that place and enjoy your trip in a calm and quiet place devoid of unnecessary or large gatherings so that you will be safe and others will be safe. Meanwhile on the country's vaccination front, booster dose vaccinations which began last Monday are currently underway prioritizing frontline healthcare and security personnel. By last evening, 9,107 personnel obtained the Pfizer vaccine as their booster dose.
In now the vaccination developments chief epidemiologist Dr Samita Ginige explained the progress of vaccinations of the children with comorbidities aged between 12 and 19 ඒ වැඩත රහන යටද මේ වෙනකොට දරුවෝ 22830කට එන්නත් කරන්න ලබා දීලා තියෙනවා මේ වෙනකොට උන්ගේ දෙවන මාත්‍රාවක් ලබා දීම ක්‍රියාත්මක වෙනවා. ඒතර ඊළඟට අපි අවසාන වශයෙන් තියෙන එකේ පාසල් ළමුන්ට ඒ කියන්නේ 16යි 19යි අතර ළමුන්ට එන්නත් කරන දෙන එක ඊයේ වෙනකොට 8 ලක්ෂ 30000ක් එන්නත් කරන එක කරලා තියෙනවා. ඒ කියන්නේ එතන ඊළඟ කණ්ඩායම මිලියන 1.3 පමණ තියෙන ඒ කියන්නේ මේ වෙනකොට 150ක් ඒ ඊළඟ කණ්ඩායම එන්නත් කරන එක කරලා පැහැදිලිවම ඒ යන විදිහට අපට ඉදිරිස අතී දෙක තුල ඊටමත් 100කට ආසන්න ප්‍රතිශත As of last evening, a total of 15 million 671,510 people in Sri Lanka have obtained a first dose of a COVID vaccine. Of this, 13 million 501,175 have obtained both vaccine doses. අපේ සමස්ත ජන ගහනේ ප්‍රතිශතයක් හැටියට ගත්තාම පළමු මාත්‍රාව මේ වෙනකොට 71කට දීලා තියෙනවා. ඒක දෙවනි මාත්‍රාව 61.5ක්යි දශම 5කට ඊයේ වෙනකොට දීලා තියෙනවා. සාමාන්‍යයෙන් ගෝලීය වශයෙන් ජන ගහනෙන් 70ක් පූර්ණ එන්නත් කරන්නේ ලබා ගත්තා කියන්නේ ඒක හොඳ සාධනීය තත්ත්වයක් ඇතයි සලකන්න. ඉතින් අනිවාර්යයෙන්ම අපිට ඉදිරි මාසය තුල ඊටමත් පැහැදිලිව මේ 71 ඉලක්කය පන්නන්න පුළුවන් කියන එක බොහොම පැහැදිලි President Gota Bir Rajapaksa met with several heads of state on the sidelines of the COP26 climate summit in Glasgow yesterday. Topics discussed included tourism promotion, enhanced skilled employment opportunities for Sri Lankans and commonwealth assistance for improved market opportunities. The world's leaders wrapped up their high-level meetings on climate change at the COP26 summit yesterday, agreeing on a list of new stances. This includes signatures of around 100 nations and parties to a global pledge to cut methane emissions by 30% of 2020 levels by 2030. In addition, there were big pledges of billions of dollars to end deforestation by 2030, announced by more than 100 countries at the start of this week. Meanwhile, President Gotabe Rajapaksa, who is in Glasgow, met with several heads of state on the sidelines of the summit. This included a meeting between President Rajapaksa and the Crown Prince and Prime Minister of Bahrain, Salman bin Hamad Al Khalifa, who discussed the further strengthening of the long-standing friendship between the two nations. Discussions also centered on a wide range of fields, including the possibility of increasing employment opportunities for Sri Lankans with professional skills instead of mostly domestic services. The president then met with the Prime Minister of Nepal, Sher Bahadur Diuba, and discussed increasing flights and promoting tourism and education between the two countries. While the president was informed of the possibility of Commonwealth assistance to expand market opportunities for member countries, the president also met with the Prince of Wales, the President of Ukraine Volodymyr Zelensky, Director General of the World Trade Organization Ngozi Okonjo-Iweala, as well as heads of state and representatives of several Middle Eastern and Western countries. The National Building Research Organization has requested the public in hilly areas to be vigilant of pre-landslide signs. This was announced after eight districts were given early landslide warnings by the department yesterday. With heavy rains in several areas of the country intensifying since last weekend, the National Building Research Organization has issued early landslide warnings to eight districts yesterday. Accordingly, Badulla, Gol, Kaltara, Kandy, and Kegol have been given early landslide warnings. Further, Martale, Noreli, and Ratnapura have also been included in the list. Train occurs in the other parts of the hilly areas in the country. People who live in these areas should be vigilant about slop and cut stop failures, and road users should also be careful about stop failures. Further, NBR would like to ask the people if you recognize any pre-landslide signs, such as development of tracks on the ground, deep and cracks and ground subsidence, slanting of trees, electrical post fences and telephone post, cracks in the floors and walls of the building which are built on slopes, the sudden appearance of springs, emerging muddy water, blockage or disappearance of existing springs. Please move away from the areas and move quickly to safe places. We'll return after this short commercial break. Don't go away.
Welcome back in business news. With a view of increasing foreign remittance inflows into Sri Lanka, the Central Bank has established a Foreign Remittances Facilitation Department with effect from today. Speaking to First at Nine, Governor of the Central Bank of Sri Lanka, Ajit Nivad Cabral, says that the government can earn 1 billion more US dollars through this department's active role in facilitating the foreign remittance inflows and competing with informal remittance avenues. Sri Lanka has several ways of earning dollar revenue into the country. This happens through merchandise exports, tourism earnings and foreign exchange remittances. Of these, foreign remittances plays a major role in Sri Lanka's economy. For an example, despite 2020 being a year in which the entire globe was affected by the COVID-19 pandemic, Sri Lanka still managed to receive over 7.1 billion US dollars in foreign remittances alone. This is a near $400 million increase compared with 2019. As of the end of August this year, foreign remittance earnings have been not lived up to expectations, standing at 4.22 billion US dollars, with the central bank attributing this drop to more expat workers opting to use informal means of transferring money. However, the view of the government is that these numbers can be boosted further. With that, the central bank announced a new measure targeting remittances, namely the establishment of a foreign remittances facilitation department with effect from today. The main aim of this department is to facilitate and streamline workers' remittances in flows to the country and try to provide a better host of benefits for Sri Lankans abroad than informal means offer. Governor of the Central Bank of Sri Lanka, Ajit Nivad Cabral, expanded on what the department's key focus will be. We realize that about $7 billion is the current inflow from foreign remittances. And the potential as well as the scope could be much more than that. So we believe that if we concentrate on those areas carefully, it would be possible for us to increase these flows quite significantly. So the purpose of this will be to facilitate first the people who are going abroad so that they can have open their accounts in a legitimate fashion and make sure that their monies can come in here. Secondly, to ensure that they are able to save money if they wish to, and that also can accumulate. Thirdly, to ensure that it comes through the formal channels so that it gets captured to our balance of payments. And by so doing, we would be ensuring that we create a new opportunity for the banks as well as for the people, as well as those who are earning abroad to really be a part of the economic structure of our country. So that will be facilitated by this department. And we believe that if we do it methodically, we can rake in at least $1 million more than what we are getting in the short term as well. Speaking further, the central bank governor also explained how well the department aims to compete with the informal remittance operations. We will have a focused competition, not just do things that will help the process only, but we will, on a focused basis, be an alternative that people can use in order to ensure that their remittances can come in conveniently, that those can be brought to their doorstep if they wish to, and that it will also have creation of new opportunities, particularly with regard to new instruments that the banks will create for those people who are remitting money from abroad. And we will also ensure that that is done. And one of the main responsibilities of this department would be to carry out the policy of the monetary board to ensure that we give them the support to all these people who are bringing in foreign currency into the country, some active support for them to bring it in. As you know, we have given support to the exporters, we give support to those who are doing consultancy work. In the same way, we should concentrate carefully on this sector where there is a large amount of money that can come in and we should facilitate that as well. Sri Lankan shares today closed at a record high for the second straight session, boosted by gains in financial stocks. The CSE Old Share Price Index settled 1.37% higher at 10,412.02 points after hitting a record high of 10,518.35 earlier in the day, while the S&P SL20 Index of more liquid stocks, however, fell 0.33% to close at 3,656.60. The day's turnover was 6.1 billion rupees, high above this year's average daily turnover of 4 billion rupees. With that, here's Demantha Matthew with today's stock market report. Similar to yesterday, we saw a major bullish trend in the stock market where the index was up by about 140 points as the SPI crossed the 10,400 mark to close at 10,412 points. However, the interesting factor is that 
a single share seems to be moving the whole market at this moment of time. So there are a lot of interest in this illiquid counters and one of these illiquid counters is single handedly moving the ASPI to significant levels at the moment with the sizable market cap of the counter. In addition to that the usual retail favorite counters seems to be on a profit taking mode. They are seeing a, a lot of turnover levels. Today's turnover exceeded the 6 billion mark and uh, the number of transactions also exceeded the 40,000 mark to reach 42,000. The Sri Lankan rupee continues to remain at 202 rupees and 99 cents against the US dollar. Let's now take a look at how the rupee traded against other major currencies during the day. With that, we wrap up tonight's edition of First at Nine. Thank you for joining. I'm Shanella Fernando. Have a good night.